Hey. Hi. Welcome to Exploring the Beauty of Algorithms with Generative Art. This is Sherman, and this is a screencast of a talk that I gave at FOSS Asia in 2016. So just a quick introduction. Um, my name is Sherman. Hi. And I am Malaysian. Uh, this is a picture of my country. It's beautiful. You should go visit sometime. Right now, I live in Singapore, though, uh, and I work as a front-end web engineer at Viki, where I do a lot of things with JavaScript. Um, but before I moved to Singapore, I was at a programming retreat called the Recurs Center, and it's a retreat for programmers, and an amazing experience. I would totally recommend it if you are a programmer and would like to go back to learning and just exploring things. Um, it's an amazing place, I had a really, really good time there. And um, I learned a lot of things as a programmer and also as a person. So one of the things that I discovered there um, was that, you know what, I really like code. And I also really like art. But it's always been a struggle to combine these two things. Like, how do you combine something that is, you know, so technical and strict, with all these rules, with art that is really freeform and creative and, you know, no holds barred kind of thing. So I struggled a lot with consolidating these two worlds, um, but while I was at the Recur Center, I was introduced to this thing called generative art, which combines uh, these two worlds that, you know, are somewhat different. and. I really enjoyed it, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about what generative art is. So what is it really? It's um, art that is generated mm, duh, um, by a non-human system that can independently decide features of the artwork. So what this means um, is, for example, art that is generated by algorithms. And You'd be surprised to know that uh, you probably have been exposed to some form of generative art uh, in the form of screensavers at some point. So if you've ever lived in the um, 90s, you would recognize these gems. This is 3D pipes. Um, I spend a lot of time in front of that CRT monitor just staring at this. Um, my personal favorite is actually Mystify. Um, look at that, it's just so hypnotic. <laughs> I love it. Um, but generative art doesn't just have to be like, you know, screensaver-y things. It can also be geometric patterns that are generated by algorithms by this piece here by um, CSG. I've included links to the artists um, in all the upcoming slides, so you can go check them out. They're really, really cool stuff. Um, another one by Jay Tarbell, which uh, also uses a very natural-looking brush texture on a geometric pattern. Um, and then, you know, it can also look really organic here, like this is a really cool piece. Uh, it can also be in 3D, this is something that I worked on. And you know, like generative art can just be outright mesmerizing and really beautiful and I'm just like fascinated by it. So you know, when, when I first saw these pieces, I was just like, huh, I wonder how they are made, you know, it must have been complex or really difficult or just like, you know, what, what, how, how do you even get started? Um, but I came to realize that, you know what, it's actually not that crazy and it's more accessible than uh, it might seem. So today we're going to talk about how, what goes on behind the scenes and I'll demo a little bit on the process that happens in a generative art piece. Uh, we'll also be looking at some algorithms that may be of interest. So today we'll be using a language called Processing. And Processing is a really simple language that was designed for the visual arts. So it uh, came out a while ago and it used to run on Java. And the code itself looks a lot like Java. So here it is. Hello, Processing code. Um, pretty awesome stuff. And I'm just going to run this here so you can see what this little snippet of code does. All right, so I have it here. Um, this is a Webpack setup, so whenever I save my file here, uh, it will update my uh, browser over here. So there are two functions, and they do exactly what they say they do. Setup and draw. 
set up sets up your canvas um, to a certain size here, 400 by 400. Um, sets the line color of whatever lines that we'll be drawing to white. And the background to this really nice orange color here. And draw also does exactly what it says it does. It draws, and in this case, it's drawing a line from um, X and Y to wherever my mouse is. And yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, so it's really simple to read and to write. Uh, I really like processing, it's fantastic. Um, the only thing though is that, you know, I'm a person of the web, so I'll be using Processing.js, which is a fantastic processing uh, part to JavaScript. And it allows us to run processing sketches in the browser, which is great. So cool, uh, we'll be talking about algorithms today. And there'll be two types of algorithms that we'll be talking about. The first being particle systems, and the second being fractals, which are two of my favorites. So let's get started with particle systems. And you're like, what are particle systems? All right. Particle systems are a collection of independent objects that move and change within a system. And um, what that means is, you know, it does things like this. For example, here, uh, this is a really simple particle system that um, emulates confetti. So you have each individual particle here that uh, gets shot up at a random direction and falls down in accordance to the rules of gravity. It's from a really good book, by the way, uh, Nature of Code. Uh, this is also a particle system. You saw this on the title page. And what this is is a bunch of particles that um, as they approach one another, form connections and form uh, polygons which, with each connected edge. And <clears throat> yeah, um, here's another piece that utilizes uh, Bezier curves. So cool, um, I'm going to do <coughs> a demo today on uh, what a particle system looks like. So we'll be doing a uh, a room of bouncy balls. And oh, before we start, actually, we're going to talk a little bit about the basics of animation. So, at the core of animation is the concept of frames. And what frames are are certain particular states of where things are. So, for example, um, in order to emulate um, the movement of a ball, uh, I may have multiple frames. and each frame is associated with a state. And in frame one, my ball might be at position x equals zero. Um, and to give the illusion of moving forward, I will update the position of my ball to x equals 10 for the second frame, and update it to x equals 30 for the third frame. So then I'll get this like nice, oh, it's moving, it's moving <laughs> kind of effect. So cool, uh, with that in mind, uh, let's look at some code. So I have this here. That here. All right, so um, I'm gonna just get rid of this first. So, first things first, I'm gonna create a uh, ball object. So, I'm gonna be doing things in a more object oriented way. I have a ball, and the ball will have a constructor, and it will take in a radius, which is the size of the ball, and also a color, and I'm just going to click call. Great. So each uh, ball would have a radius and a color. Um, it will also have to have a position. Um, and p vectors are just vectors with uh, x and y properties, <coughs> also z, but we won't be using that. Um, and it will need a velocity, which is a speed that it will be moving at. Uh, in our bouncy room of balls. So when we first uh, create it, I'm just going to set all of these variables. So call color, and then <clears throat> I'm just going to um, give it a position of uh, just 100, 100. All right, and a velocity of 2, 2. So it'll move um, 2 pixels to the right and 2 pixels down with every frame, every time it gets updated. All right, cool. So I have a ball, that's great. I uh, can't do anything with it right now. 
but I'm going to give it a uh, draw function so we can see it. Otherwise, we'll never be able to see your ball. Um, and to draw it, I'll need to set the fill color to whatever the color is set for this ball and draw it with the ellipse function, which takes in the x and y position uh, of the ball. And the height and width, width and height of the uh, ellipse in this case, here I'm just making it a sphere. So that's fine. Uh, and I'm going to create ball B, create my ball, plus a new ball, and I'll give it a radius of maybe like 30, and a color of um, white. Oh, I also forgot to I said it so it doesn't have a stroke around the ball. Alright, and when I, so remember I talked about frames, um, the draw function here gets called at every frame, so every frame is just going to redraw the ball. In this case, um, whoops, nothing is showing up. It's because I have used post instead of position, position, and ta-da, we have a ball. Great. So it's not very interesting, um, and we want our ball to be able to move. So in order to do that, I'm going to introduce an update method, which updates the position of the ball with the velocity. So it updates it at um, we have two pixels to the right, two pixels down. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm going to update the ball at every frame. And woo, we got a ball, but um, not so good because we are uh, not getting, we are seeing the ball being rendered over and over again. So in order to um, give illusion of it moving and not like writing over and over um, its previous state, we're going to just clear the background at every time. And ta-da, we have a moving ball. Yay. Okay. Um, but that's also great because it's actually just going off the screen whenever it hits the edge. So in order to fix that, um, what I'm going to do is that, is that I'm going to set the velocity to go in the opposite direction when it hits an edge. So how this looks like is that when the position of x is less than 0, so when it goes off to the left, or if this position dot x is uh, more than width. Um, in this case, it means you know um, it's gone off to the right. I'm going to set the velocity to in the x-axis to go in the opposite direction. And we're going to do... Oh, you can't see that. Uh, we're going to do the same for the uh, y position as well. Oops, didn't mean to do that. All right. Okay. Um, instead of x, we have y here. Alright, and there we go. Alright, so this should now let our ball bounce around. And yes, that works. Okay, fantastic. Um, it's a little bit small. I'm just going to make this ball a little bigger. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, but that's not really interesting, right? Because it's just, it's just one ball. So in order to... Um, add in some more interesting bits, I'm going to add in some form of randomization. So instead of having the ball start at the same place every time, which is 100, 100, I'm going to give it a random position. And I have a random class, um, a random, sorry, helper function here that I wrote, and you can see it under util is, uh, here. And what it does is that it just uh, gives me a random point on my screen, somewhere from uh, in this area here on my canvas. So let's see. So now it will start at random places over there, random places, yep, different places. Okay, great. Um, and you know what? Now I want to just have include like more balls. Let's put that in. So I want to mix in a little bit of JavaScript here, um, create an array, and um, I have a certain number of balls that I want to create, in this case, maybe like 20, 20 balls, and um, I'm just going to insert that into 20 balls into my array, so there's num balls, i++, uh -huh. and then balls.push b already, and uh, this is not going to work because I need to do this for every single ball, I need to draw and update it, 
uh, both for each JavaScript for each. Um, so we do that. Oops. Do, 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 do. And uh, that should work, but it's not working. Mm-hmm. And let's uh let's check out what's going on there. Can't read property car and undefined. What is that? That's strange, but okay. Oh oh huh. Hmm. Typo. There we go. It's missing a semicolon. And we have balls. And woo, all twenty of them. Uh, but that's not really interesting either because they're all going in the same direction and as in it has the same velocity. So I'm just going to randomize that as well. Um, velocity is also a helper function that I wrote. Um, you can check it out. It's really simple. Um, I'm just like doing this for the sake of um, simplicity. And there we have it. Random balls bouncing in an orange space. Um, I'm just going to change the background to a uh, slightly nicer uh, gray color. And you know what? We can also randomize the colors of these balls to make it more interesting. So um, and the sizes as well. So I'm going to do that. Um, and uh, I'm going to use a built-in random function for just the numbers um, from the <coughs> ranges of um, 30 to 50. One balls in that size, and we have random ball sizes. Great. Uh, I'm also going to randomize the color. And I'm going to do it from like, let's say 90 to 55 for each channel, red, green, and blue. All right. And that should give us random looking bouncy balls. All right. Yeah. Um, I'm going to bump that up to like 40. And it's a little bit slow. So um, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to uh, multiply the velocity by 2. So. Let me get like twice as fast. Yeah, and we have a bunch of random bouncy balls, which is like going very crazy right now. Um, and you know what? When I did this, I realized that you know if I didn't redraw the background at every frame, it would actually leave a trail of colorful lines, and it actually looks pretty interesting. Um, let me just, oops, woo. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna make that a little smaller. I think that would look good. Yeah, and I call this two D pipes. Abstract two D pipes. All right, cool. So, um, so we've seen a little bit of that <laughs> particle system. Awesome. Uh, bouncy balls are fun. All right, and now let's move on to fractals. Fractals are very cool. Uh, I'm pretty sure you have seen some fractals in this lifetime. Here is a really popular one called the Mendel set. It's a really really cool piece. Um, and this is sort of Sierpinski's triangle, which puts a triangle in a triangle, and triangles in that triangle, so you have triangles all the way down. Uh, fractals are really interesting, and at the core of it um, is recursion. So is, uh, are you familiar with recursion, perhaps? Um, if not, to first understand recursion, you must understand recursion, um, <laughs> which is a recursive definition. I don't know why I find it funny. But, but really, um, what recursion is, is repetition in a self-similar kind of way. So here's an example of uh, my favorite fractal curve, which is the co-snowflake, um, which starts off with this. So you have a simple curve here. Um, I know it's, I say curve, even though it's all pointy. Um, but what you do with uh, the co-snowflake is that you take a simple curve like this and you replace every single edge with a smaller version of that curve. Ha! Huh. And you do that again each edge with a smaller version of the curve, and you do that again, and you get this cool looking snowflake thing if you just like put, put um, three of those to get to get things together. So I really like this, uh, it's really cool stuff. And um, recursion can be really beautiful with like, you know, really simple rules, like all you're doing is, oops, all you're doing is just like, you know, replacing each edge with like a smaller version of itself, and just like, bam, you know. Um, with very simple rules, you can get something that's really complex and gorgeous. So I really like recursion and fractals. Uh, I'm going to do a quick demo of a uh, recursive, sorry, fractal project that I worked on. 
I'm going to show it to you. Do, do, do. All right. And ta-da! Um, so I really I like the cool snowflake so much that I decided to uh, play around a little bit more of it and uh, worked on a tessellation. So what a tessellation is, is a, a tiling of it. So I realized that each um, snowflake can actually be replaced by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven other smaller snowflakes. And what's going on right here is that um, we start off with our typical core snowflake. Um, this is a third level uh, fractal, which means that ages have been replaced three times. And I replaced this one snowflake with seven other snowflakes, like six small ones and one big one. Uh huh. And I can do that again. And again. And this is going to take a while. And you get this really cool looking tiling. Um, and you can also vary the, the different levels of uh, recursion as well. And what I like to do is to um, vary the transparency of the width as well. And it gives you this really cool looking thing. And I think you can take another level into this way. <coughs> and this is going to be crazy. But it's going to take a while. And yeah, ta-da! Um, recursion is awesome and really, really beautiful. Okay, cool. So yeah, this is this one that I show you. Um, my favorite fractal. So if, if there's anything that um, is a takeaway from today is that, you know, I hope that I've shown you know, how simple algorithms can result in really beautiful art, like recursion and particle systems. They're not incredibly complex concepts, but an application can result in really unexpectedly beautiful visuals. Uh, and it's amazing how you can do all these really interesting things with algorithms or like programmatic thinking. It's great. I love it. <laughs> So yeah, um, if you're interested in learning more, there are lots of resources out there for processing. Um, the processing.js learning page is fantastic. There's lots of examples of how to do different things in processing. Um, and I would highly recommend uh, checking it out. This is how I started. Uh, there's also the Khan Academy course that uses processing and has its own IDE. There are lots of books and also tutorials that are free to use <coughs> Excuse me, out there. Um, I'm, I'm including the links here in the slides, which I will provide you the link uh, down below. And yeah, um, go make some art with code and keep in touch. Let me know what you think and if you've been enjoying the journey. Yeah, go make some art with code. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.